Thank you so much for being here. My name is Sandy Penson of Conway, and I'm the director of the School of Communication Studies. I want to especially welcome those of you who are from other areas of campus or who are even from off campus. We welcome you into our space to hear our incredible guest speaker today. So allow me to provide some introduction. And before I do that, I do know that there might be some people here who need to leave early. We'll have some folks coming in a little bit late just because of class schedules and things. And Dr. Duffy already knows that. So please don't feel shy if that's you and you might need to leave a little bit early. It's completely fine. Um, so Dr. Graham Duffy is who we are here to hear from today. He is a full-time paramedic from Houston, Texas, with a career that spans over 25 years in that industry. His journey into the world of EMT and life-saving began at the young age of 14, when he was able to, um, he, he was encountered an adult who was in respiratory arrest, and he was able to perform rescue breathing and also to call an ambulance. And this was in rural Kentucky. And that really inspired what has happened for the rest of his life. At age 19, Dr. Duffy became one of the youngest certified paramedics in the country, um, which is an incredible accomplishment. And he served in a variety of challenging environments as both a manager and a field provider. And those ranged from critical care helicopters to both rural and urban 911 units. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in speech communication with an emphasis in public, the public relations right here in our program, now known as communication studies, and that was in 2000. And then he continued on in our program to receive a Master of Science in speech communication in 2002. And under the direction of Dr. Nalanjana Varden, over here, um, he completed his research report for his master's program, and that was titled Incongruent Perceptions and Training Styles, the Paramedic in Conflict with the Emotionally Charged Bystander. While he was obtaining those two degrees here at SIU, he also worked full time with two different paramedic services based out of Marion. He then went on to earn a second master's, this time in human and organizational systems, as well as a PhD in human development, and both of those were from Fielding Graduate University. His dissertation investigated paramedic decision making during moments of extreme stress. Dr. Duffy is an incredible example of how to bridge the things that we do in academia into non-academic professional fields. He's written two books on communication and co-authored his groundbreaking work that we'll hear more about today, on the use of hypnosis and emergency medicine. And his latest book, Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes, quickly climbed to Amazon's number one in the emergency medicine category. So that's a really incredible feat as well. In addition to books, he has other publications in journals such as Social Science and Medicine and the Journal of Emergency Medical Services. And he has an appointment at the, as, at the Institute for Social Innovation as a research fellow, and that's at Fielding Graduate University. As an educator, Dr. Duffy's taught numerous university level courses in uh, topics such as interpersonal communication, leadership, EMS, and more. And he currently teaches as an online part-time assistant professor of communication at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. He's also a key member of the clinical team at City Ambulance Service in Spring, Texas. And then previously, among other positions, he served as a paramedic supervisor and as a marketing manager at Coastal EMS, which is in Houston, Texas. Aside from reading his publications that I mentioned, you can learn more about his work by tuning in to his successful podcast, EMS Research with Professor Bram, where he shares insights and research. It kind of baffles me to say this, but I've known Graham for most of those 25 years because we entered the master's program at the same time here at SIU. So I'm really excited to have him here 
to present today. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Graham Duffy as he presents Emergency Healing, the Power of Hypnotic Communication. Thank you so much. Um, before I get started, I just want to say, uh, let's take our phones to go to post. I just had to do that this morning. And there's no greater honor that anyone can have that's invited to come back to the place where you all began. And this is just an amazing, um, amazing journey for me. And I want to thank you all for being here with me to uh, to talk through and, and understand uh, what this is what this has been like for me. I uh, I I'm going to talk today about paramedic stuff, and it would just really help if you would, even if you're a nurse, or even if you're a, a communication scholar, or even if you don't have anything to do with this, it would just help if today, try to imagine yourself as a paramedic, imagine yourself as someone that works on the ambulance, um, because that's the kind of communication perspective that, that we're going to take today. We're also, I've had questions, we're also not going to be hypnotizing anyone <laughs> um, This is an academic uh, discussion. And I want to start out by telling you about a story. I have two stories today, but one of them is a story about this little girl. They got hurt really bad. And I, you know, it's one of those things that I'll just never forget because um, this little girl was about four years old and she got mauled by a dog. And the result was that she had um, torn uh, parts of her face and, 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 upper, and upper body. And my assessment of her was that she was really okay. And I don't know if you know, but anytime you get anything in the, in the head that it's a, a laceration, there's just a lot of blood. So sometimes these situations just look worse than they are. And it was at that moment that I, I realized like this little girl is okay. But nobody, I mean, nobody knows that she's okay. We have parents that are freaking out. We have grandparents who are too. And um, so the, uh, the overwhelming nature of everything really meant that this little girl could grow up to be very scared of dogs for the rest of her life. I mean, this is the time. This is the moment. And so I, I began to, uh, to take this case and, and realize that Everybody freaking out and saying all this negative stuff about the dog, saying it was negative stuff to her about getting into where she got. And all of that stuff that was negative contributed to the to the event. And so I'm imagining that, and this is a lot of years later, I really wish that I could visit that girl and see if she's a dog. I love dogs so much. I have two at home, you know? And so I I, I kind of understand what you know what that can do for someone. And it, these kinds of um, these kinds of things can can make a difference. And what it is is thinking about today the power that and the influence that words can have, especially during extreme moments of stress. And the this stuff can be just really powerful. And and I'm going to say um, uh, sort of a summary of everything that I'm going to be talking about today. First, and then I'll dive into it more later. But I have a, a theory, my co author and I have a theory that we subscribe to that basically says that you can experience life threatening fear in a way that predisposes you to being in a hypnotic trance. And it's related to an extreme amount of fear that you go through because. You may be having a heart attack or a stroke or bleeding to death, right? And so that is a very scary situation. And then at the same time, you have called out for help and the responders are coming to you. And when they show up, they bring equipment. They supposedly know what they're doing. They have a badge, right? An official badge. So this kind of power dynamic and the person having such an extreme um, fear event is really has a predisposition to causing hypnosis to just occur. And so this little girl, back to the little girl, you know, um, is in a position to be very influenced by, by that event. And I want to unpack uh, some of this with you because over the past 25 years, I have been working to um, <clears throat> tread this line between working as a paramedic and working as an academic communication scholar. And it's not like 
uh, it's, it's not like those are areas that automatically merge in any kind of way. And I ended up thrusting myself into the work of trying to help teach and show at emergency responders how to best communicate during these situations. And really what happens a lot of time when paramedics go into a situation is that we have a tendency to forcefully interrogate the person. And I understand why. It's because we think they're dying. We're trying to make sure, we're trying to figure things out. But so but that's what happens. We interrogate them aggressively. And then once we sort of figure out what's going on, we just move the task orientation. Okay, they need an IV, they need oxygen, they need the blood pressure, you know, those are it's just a task. And a lot of a lot of what is missed is the communication element and the ability that you have to help someone other than just give them a drug to, to make to make things better. I wrote an article in the Journal of Social Science and Medicine that really pulled some of these elements together in, in a cool kind of way. And for the research that I did, I theorized that, or I, I, um, I laid out the assumption that, you know, a lot of times paramedics, when you think about the stress that, that they go through, you might think, oh my gosh, they had to do stuff to save a life, right? Those are the things that I hear. And then you might watch a TV show and you see them doing compressions or, you know, something that, that, um, that, that might be, really stressful and those forms can be stressful but as someone with a really extensive background in, in this i want to tell you that most of these paramedics know what they're doing right so if, when the emergency occurs and that life threatening thing happens they actually know what to do okay so because they know what to do there's just a different level of stress that happens in that moment as compared to the anticipatory moment so what I theorize is that between the time when that alarm bell goes off in the fire station or wherever it is, that alarm emergency happens. Between then and the time the paramedic goes through everything they have to do to read a map and read the dispatch notes and figure out where the patient's at and, and rush to the scene and carry the, the bags that they have to carry into the patient and be out of breath. And you know, that is a very stressful thing. And I really believe that the most stressful time is that time for the paramedics because they know what to do, they know how to do it, and they desperately are there, you know, to want to help. But getting there is um get, getting there is very stressful because there's so many what us in your mind. You try to pre-plan and the situation ends up so that you're right there in, in, in their face in that moment. And so now you can understand why somebody this paramedic would be like interrogation, interrogation, question, but because they are very stressed because they're going to automatically be making assumptions that worst case scenario that they need to fix. And so this time is during this time that the, the paramedic needs the the take control of their communication. And it, the reason is, I've laid it out already, the patient is in a desperate position and how they act, what they do, what they say, can make a big difference in that moment. And it's the most you know, desperate moment for, for, the, for the patient as well. And I just know that from how it, it's been across the country in my work that in emergency medicine, it doesn't matter if it's an ambulance or an emergency room, communication can be really harsh. And so if you have other experiences in healthcare when you go in for a surgery or you go in for testing or maybe get, get admitted to the hospital and, and you're on the floor, there's, there's a different kind of communication and care that you would experience as opposed to being in the emergency room where people are in life and death situations and, and the people that are, are there to, to take care of them. And things like looking at your patient in the face as a real person, sometimes don't happen. And I worked as a paramedic for so long and I would see so many cases that I, I felt myself starting to do that too. Like I would not necessarily look at them as a person and the face and think of them as that. Instead, I would think of them as a case. Okay, I'm gonna categorize this case as an abdominal pain patient. And so because they're abdominal pain patient, I need to figure out these things. That very scientific, not person, that needs care, person that needs positive communication and vibes. 
and it's a it's a big problem as far as I'm concerned. And um, I want to tell you that it's so bad that the culture in some emergency rooms is that the nurses will talk to take care of the patients, and then they come back to the nurse station to do the charting, and then they talk bad about their patients. You know, it's just not okay, and it's accepted because in this environment, their main concern, their main focus is. Um, what interventions need to be done based on the diagnosis that's happened. And uh, sometimes those interventions are emergent. And then, of course, just because you as a patient are not experiencing a life-threatening emergency, it definitely doesn't mean, you know, next door, in your next room over, someone might be. And so these kinds of, um, the lack of communication training and then the, the situations of stress that, that people are in from both the, the patient and the, the, the providers really uh, make up uh, a situation that I would like to fix. It's one of the things that I have taken on as a, an interest because I think that if we can work to just pay attention to how we communicate with people, we can make a really big difference. And a lot of what I want to talk about today is about the journey I went through to figure this stuff out. And also, I want to look at the actual words that can be helpful in these situations for you. So when you talk to most emergency room physicians, and I've talked to lots of them about the subject, when you talk to most emergency room physicians, what I get out of them, when I say something about hypnosis and paramedics or hypnosis and emergency medicine, I literally see an eye roll, like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, because to them, it, it's, it's not something that's, that they're comfortable with, it's not anything from their training, it's, it's just not there. And so I knew that that was the case. And I did my PhD at a school that had professors from institutions from all over the country that, um, that had influence. And one of those professors, uh, I had a lot in common with him. And he, he was, um, he was an EMT, he was a firefighter, he had a, a love for horses, he was a, a professor in my department that, uh, that, uh, that had some of, the, some of these kinds of similar interests. But then on top of it, he was also a certified hypnotherapist that has spent years and years conducting and doing hypnosis. And he had a, he has a, he has a doctorate in education and also a doctorate in uh, health psychology. So. This is uh, a person that is big time, big credentials. And he was sort of seen as an outcast by a lot of even the faculty members. And, um, and it's because he was really um, eccentric. And so I worked on my dissertation totally separate from any of his influence because I did my dissertation on paramedic decision making, and I looked at some of the phenomenon involved with paramedic stress. But then, in this totally separate camp, I wanted to do the most of stuff, but I just felt like that I could not taint my PhD with hypnosis because if I did, then I would have these people who don't participate, just like you know, just like I had seen in real life. And so, when I turned in my dissertation. To let, to let the review process started. That is the same day that I took a deep dive into working on this book that, that I'm going to uh, talk about today. And uh, Don Trent Jacobs, sends also with Four Arrows, he's an indigenous scholar. And in addition to all of this, and he co authored the book with me. And it was so special because, because of my background in, in communication and as a paramedic, and because of his background. In emergency medicine and hypnosis and psychology, these these this book would not have been able to happen without both of us, you know, both of our influences. But it was just like my PhD journey had like a, like a parrot on my shoulder. Like someone was always there, and I always you know wanted to engage. But I waited until until the end, and I don't know that it mattered or not that much that I that I waited. But what ended up happening was that I had this accumulation of things that got to that got to blossom at once and one of the things that blossomed was that i 
was able to use the techniques that come with interacting with emergency patients from my book with you know with my patients. And so this was one of these things where we studied and did research together, and then I practiced in the field, and then um, came back to the drawing board table and looked at looked at scenarios of how to make make things happen. The book is um, well. This is what I was <clears throat> that um, that I would co-author the book with, and Floros and I um, were hypnotic communication and emergency uh, medical settings for life saving for life saving and therapeutic outcomes. And it's an academic book put out by Rutledge that is not something that I make any money from. I mean, I, I guess I will someday. Maybe they say five percent. I don't know what they told me, but <laughs> that's right. What I am doing with this is I'm I'm working to influence the uh, the emergency medical system across the country. And so I think that there's people out there that say things like, "Oh well, tell me what to say." Well, you wrote a book about it. What do I do if I have the, the, an emergency patient? Or what? And I tell them that they need to take a first aid and see shark class, you know, because we don't want to we don't want to do anything different than the standard medical treatment that we know that patient needs, right? So nothing in my book, nothing that I'm saying that we would say or do to patient would be anything different from that standard uh, medical treatment. So the, the I used the word, I was in Johnny's office using the word wizard earlier, but, you know, it's not like you can be a wizard and say, let it be done and something happens with hypnosis. There's it's much more involved in that, but there are elements that um, that are that are really cool to investigate together. So when I first started talking to people just about his muscles in general, one of the people I talked to was my younger adult brother, his name's Kyle. And Kyle said to me that uh, you know I can't be hypnotized. There's no way I'm not one of those people. <laughs> like I said to him immediately, didn't take a second to immediately say to him, don't you remember how many times it takes someone to call your name to pull you away from the TV. So you remember, <laughs> Kyle, Kyle, uh, you know, and so that is a form of trance. That is a form of hypnosis. And when I told him that, oh, <laughs> maybe I can be, maybe I am influenced. And so I don't know about you all, do you get like that with movies sometimes where you're just so involved, you might as well be in that, in that moment yourself. And sometimes the, Trance qualities work so that a person is on autopilot in a trance. Um, autopilot, maybe an example would be like in a vehicle, like that's an autopilot in general. And then other times, um, there are other forms like where you can be in the moment. Um, and hypnosis is something that has been around for a long time. And it, admittedly, there's a lot of doubt in the medical community about it. And that's one of the things I'm here to talk about. But, for folks that speak English, in the English-speaking tradition, it's thought that hypnosis was founded or sort of figured out by a Catholic priest in the 1700s uh, named Joseph uh, Johann Gasser. And the thing is, is that he was performing exorcisms, I guess, is what they were, so I don't know. Yeah, wasn't it? <laughs> but, but in other cultures, Flavor, the flavors of hypnosis have, have also permeated. And I think that some of what we get is, is a little bit of religious uh, base or has a feel to it. And then also, of course, a lot of the negativity from uh, psych hospitals and stuff, these, these all things are things that get wrapped into it. So what is hypnosis? I'm gonna give you my own definition, okay? So I think that hypnosis is an ultra mental state of trance that allows a person to focus their attention in a way that activates physical and mental responses differently than they could normally. So these hypnotic opportunities take place in the imagination, in the realm of imagination. And people who are better at mental imagery are just easier to hypnotize. So like my partner that I work with on the ambulance, he's ex-military, and he talks to me about how the military has um, reprogrammed his mind so that 
he has an unlike filter, like he can filter himself. So I can imagine the shoulder soldier standing in line, and, you know, at attention and having to, you know, think about their every movement. He has mentally conditioned himself like that. So what that means is that if I if I say something uh, like a, a red cart, like that I'm looking at here, you know, in his mind, probably a picture of a red cart is not going to come up. But I'm kind of like that, and I, some of you may be able as well. It might depend on your mood. It might depend on what's going on in the conversation. But but sometimes you might have just the ability to take and imagine what that that person is saying um, visually in your mind. And uh, other times you may have to sort of ask yourself to 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 take that on. And the way it works is that. During hypnosis itself, the facilitator acts as a guide. So we, when we do hypnosis, when we facilitate hypnosis, we are not doing anything to anybody. Like I'm not doing something to you. What it is, is it's a partnership where I am working to guide that person's thoughts. And so it's something that totally requires the person um, to be okay with, to be in partnership with, and uh, so that there is no against your uh, will kind of kind of. Thing. So let's let's look at some of the um, cool stuff that I was able to find in, in the research world that that spurred this uh, book forward. The, the first thing was that there is this uh, researcher named Eric Wright who was a physician and a, a, a researcher, psychologist, so he, he did both. And he was in Kansas and he did an experiment in the 1970s where he took different groups of ambulance workers and he created an experiment. And the experiment was that one group of ambulance workers would be the control group, and then they had two other um, groups that were specifically trained in how to communicate with the emergency patient. And so the, uh, the way that he uh, approached it um, was in a way so that, well, he believed that it was important to protect the person's listening ears from negativity, total negativity. So if you can imagine that if you have someone that just passed out in the room here and there's a lot of people to say a lot of things, you know, those kinds of negative words um, don't have a place in that moment. And we want to try to protect the patient from that. So that's one of the things that, that he um, pushed for. The other thing that he pushed for was the rapport building uh, piece of it. So you have to like connect with your patient. And then it's very simple, but the other thing that he did was he asked people to read a statement, that would be a statement of caring. And as I said, it's something we're not doing all the time. We're not doing this, these uh, caring statements anymore. And what I find, you know, when I first started in emergency medicine. I went to school and did a first responder class. And the guy that was teaching the first responder class made it really clear to us that we don't need to be telling people reassuring statements. We should never tell someone that they're going to be OK. And he said the reason we should not tell someone they're going to be OK is because they might die. And we don't want to lie to them. You are there to do a job. You're not there. You know, this was the kind of thing. And it just blew my mind. I was 17 years old taking that class at the junior college, and this man was probably 65 and had been doing it his whole life. And this is how emergency medicine is to go. I'm supposed to go like a machine and never be, you know, give positive reassuring statements, never, you know, show caring. And I had a real problem with that. Like early on, I knew that was just not right. And so I think that Dr. Wright had a, a similar uh, view of this. And what he did was he took this research study and um, he talked about it at the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis Conference. And the, during this time, I'm going to read uh, some, something what he had said. He said that 
talks about how the fear that people go through when they experience these life threatening events. He said, these individuals, through the impact of an emergency environment, began to have the terror of survival, the fear of whether or not it was going to be the next moment. And then he went on to talk about how really insignificant everything else in life seems during that moment of patients, right? Like major things could be happening, but this is this is potential death, you know. And so what he did was um, work to tell tell the, the animals group, protect from negative communication and um, protect from negative communication. Use positive communication. And then the big thing was that they had each of the patients have a card that was read to them. I think the way it worked was that sometimes they had memorized and sometimes they read the card. And um, this is a time when the paramedic has now figured out what's wrong with the patient, started treatment, um, protected from negativity. Given reassurance statements, so all these things have happened. Then after all this has happened, um, this is the this is the statement that he uh, had them read in the experiment. The worst is over. We're taking you to the hospital. Everything is being made ready. Let your body concentrate on repairing itself and feeling secure. Let your blood vessels, everything bring to a state of preserving your life. Everything is being maintained. Things are being made ready for you in the hospital. We're getting there as quickly and safely as possible, and you're now in a safe position. The worst is over. So what I do in my practice as a paramedic is I don't read that exact statement, but what I do do is I I take words from that time and I use that with the patient. So definitely the 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 words the worst is over can be very, you know, uplifting for someone, right? That, that's in a bad spot. But what we're doing is, is we're giving them some reassurance. And these are people who are gonna be just ready to on every word that you say because they're very worried about their situation. So final look at all this was initially done from an extreme skeptical um, angle. And that's why this enhanced to sort of build on me. And, and, and what I found is that through my research, when I say research, I mean through my reading of other people's research, what I found was that, you know, on these hypnosis studies, there are like sometimes 50% of the time they find that hypnosis didn't occur or it didn't take action. And what's going on, I think, is that there are there's a lot of research out there that is psychology-based or human behavior-based, and, and hypnosis is part of that. And these these things uh when a, the, the scientific uh, principle when they apply to the human body, just it just doesn't line up like a scientific experiment would. You can't reproduce the same thing every time because let's be honest, people have a sex drive, people have to poop, people have to be able to, you know, there are there are demands that we have that we that we have to um, take care of as humans, and and during that that time it changes our mood, it changes our disposition, and so sometimes. Um, I think that the hypnosis doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because that person, the, the patient or, or whoever the hypnosis is, is supposed to be geared towards, um, does not partner with the therapist in a way so that they are buying into what's being said, so that they are um, following along. And it's not like, it's not like something that anybody can do always. But I want to say that these situations that you have where uh, the patient is in this predisposition state due to the, the fear that 
these are very much special. And the reason I say it like that is because when they do research studies on, on hypnosis, what they have done a lot of times is they take higher, um, highly desired, I'm sorry, highly hypnotizable people, and they do research on those people. And so it's not, it's not possible in the same kind of way to do hypnosis research on the fear that someone is going through because they think they might die, right? I mean, if we did, we'd probably have ethical considerations. If it, you know, it's, it's just not that easy to do. And so the stuff that's happened out there has been hypnosis. And it started out with um, the EEG, the electroencephalogram. I can't say it all right, but it's where they put wires all over your head. And as a child, I uh, had to go through uh, this same thing because my mom loved me enough to take me to psychology, to psychiatry, right? So I um, went through it. And what they did was is they took a oil pen, like an oil pencil, and they draw landmarks on your head. And it hurts. And it's frustrating because there's like, I don't know, 20 uh, attachments that they're going to put on different parts of your head. So they're going to draw all those on your head, make sure they're all right, and then they attach the electrodes. And what they do with that EEG is they use that to be able to look at what brain waves that your body, that your mind is putting out, right? So you may all be familiar with brain waves that are different when you sleep versus when you're awake. Those are the kinds of things that initially, when they were doing hypnosis research, that they that they got into. And then some more scanners became advanced and able to look at the brain in different ways. And that allowed for them to realize that, um, yes, people who are hypnotized do have a, a brain wave that's special to their hypnotic state. So that's kind of cool. But then more development happened with machines and they were able to do more isolation of what parts of the brain are affected by uh, by hypnosis, and the cool thing was that the research was able to find where uh, the where the blood flow kind of uh, centers in in the brain to do its work in that moment, and that moment. That's, that's happening is affecting the anterior cingulate cortex, it's part of the brain. If you imagine a, uh, a headband around your head, sort of in the front of that headband, like in deep, it's really in your brain. <laughs> but they were able to see that there was more blood flow happening to those people at that at that time. So that part of the brain, I'm not a brain guy, I'm a calm guy, right? I'm, a, I'm, I'm a communication scholar and a paramedic. So I, uh, I, can tell you that that still yet I can still yet tell you that that part of the brain is what handles things like cortisol levels, and stress, and so it kind of makes sense that those those things would be related. And now today we have something called a PET scan machine, and I don't know if you're familiar with a PET scanner, but it's not like a key cat who <laughs> didn't scan. A PET scanner is commonly a scanning device that's used to detect cancer in patients. So what they would do is you would have your blood drawn and they draw your blood and then they would attach um, radioactive um, uh, components to your blood and they give it back to your body. And then they will run you through the scanner. And when they run you through the scanner, um, what they do is they try to detect glucose. So in your brain, when your brain's working, it uses glucose to work. So they were able to use the, the PET scanner and take highly hypnotizable people, put them in that PET scanner, and what happened was that the scan showed up so that a certain part of the brain lit up, right? So it showed that this is the part using glucose. And it, it, and it also corresponded with the other study, you know, about where the blood flow is. So the reason I mentioned all this is because, and let me show you a slide of what um, this is the slide from the, the, the groundbreaking research study that really was able to show this. This is the slide from that study. And it's, 
it's really awesome to be able to say to someone who says hypnosis is not real. It's really awesome to be able to show them a, 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 a picture of something like this. Say, well, we can see it, you know. And so that's really important for some people that you know need to get over that hump of like, is this a real thing? Is this a scientific based thing? Is this a human behavior thing? You know, what where where does this fall? And so um, this is this is what if you were a scientist, you would be able to, to see on the screen. So what about for the rest of the paramedics? Like, how do they even know what is going on with a hypnotic trance? Or when do we know how to how to see that? Well, there are some definite signs that someone is has entered into a hypnotic trance. And here's the thing that happened to me that was so crazy. When I was working with Four Arrows, uh, Don Trent Jacobs, my co-author, when I was working with him through these concepts and we were researching together and writing together, then I came uh, one day and I just I just talked to him and I said, you know what? I bet that because you have been a hypnotherapist for so long and you just see these people and can see their to me and, and already know they're in a hypnotic trance. Is that the case? Is that what happened? And he said, yes. And I was like, dang it. And the reason I was like that was because I just felt like I was in a position to, you know, I had spent years trying to figure out what's going on with these people. Like, why, if I ask them a question, can't they just answer it like they would normally? And what happens is that folks who are in a, a, a trance like this have a tendency to be uh, more mechanicalistic about their uh, movements and their behavior and their thought processes. And so you can, it's almost like you can see them thinking because they're only ready to take things like one new step and this step, and, you know, because, because of the, the trance that's involved. So here are some of the other signs. And if you'll notice yeah, that, um, some of these things sort of lend themselves to what fear is. If you're scared, how are you going to look? <gasps> right? Eyes open, mouth open, body forward. These are the same things that we look for when uh, we encounter our emergency patients that are going through this. So it's not every time that this works out, right? <laughs> Sometimes we have people who are just not willing. And that's cool. I think that cell phones kind of have caused a problem with all this because folks who like, you know, want to be on their cell phones for that reassurance instead of like with me, or if they might um, totally just avoid the communication with me. That's fine. But what I know is that they're still benefiting from it if I give it to them. So what I do, even people that don't want to interact with me that much as a paramedic or patients that would not be in a position to, to partner with me for that hypnosis moment. I still make sure that I am delivering positive, reassuring statements. I'm still going to tell them all the stuff because whether it works or not, I know that it's it's uh, it has the potential to really help someone feel good. I um, was this last year. I um, published this journal article in the Journal of Emergency Medical Services about this very topic, because if a patient doesn't have any kind of trust in you as the authority figure, then the things that you say aren't going to matter that much. And so that's why I went in and pushed for the idea that it's time to show people that you care about them. And so there's really no magic words that you use in hypnosis. Like you don't walk in and say, be healed. You don't walk in and say, calm down, and that would just work. You have to, you know, um, approach the person through a rapport building uh, attitude that it shows that you're there to uh, to help them. I was. Uh, First in Houston, and I went to work at a 911 agency in Houston, and I knew things were going to be different there because I was used to doing uh, medicine around here where things were more rural. And I um, I got these two preceptors that uh, were working with me, and one was a nurse paramedic, and the other one would have been a paramedic as long as me and was a paramedic instructor. So both of these people I had I had respect for, and I wanted to perform well in front. So I'm a new uh, new to them, you know, paramedic. So they're watching me, making sure I do stuff right before they release me online. This is the one. And 
I interacted with my patients uh, in almost every in almost every case by introducing myself. So I say, "Hi, I'm Bram. I'm a paramedic here to help you." And then you know, so that was a normal thing that I uh, very much did. And they talked down to me and just treated me like crap for that. And you know, all it did. I don't know if you ever had talk, somebody tell you that you did something wrong that you know is completely right. I was in that, yeah, you know, I, I lost respect for these people, and I thought, this is how you treat your patients, seriously. And, and honestly, the way that it seems that, that they treated their patients was like if they were doing veterinary medicine, you know, like, if, like it's not even human. And this is so wrong, so incredibly wrong. That I, and so for all of these reasons, and for the stuff that I've discovered and, and for the ways that um, that I have been able to investigate how to talk to patients, right? This is this is why I am standing up here to say I would like to change the culture of how we approach people, how we talk to people in uh, emergency medicine. And this topic is really special to me because back when I was um, first a paramedic, one of the things that I did was I took care of a guy that had chest pain. So I was, she mentioned it to you, I was the, one of the youngest paramedics in the state at 19 years old. And so I am uh, supposed to be the rescuer here to help this older gentleman who's having chest pain. And let's just imagine he was very old and he is very young because that was really the dynamic. And what I tried to do is I tried with all I had to talk this guy and go in the hospital with him. So now technology today, we can put 12 EPG on him. And in some cases we can actually determine if you're having a heart attack or not. We didn't have that technology back then, but the guy had just met every every sign, and I definitely worked really hard to try to talk him into going to the hospital in an aggressive way because I was worried about it, and I failed. So he would not go. So whether it be because um, he didn't trust me, or I don't know the whole reason why, but he didn't go. And then this is an adult in a rural part of the community that unfortunately, you know, meant that. Like when that one got called the second time, I was the one to respond and I found him dead. And he got, it was a big deal. He was wearing the same clothes that he was wearing that, you know, when I saw him before. And it was way too late by this point. And so it really affected me. I was like, this cannot happen. I felt like I had killed him. No, probably not. Like he could have got to the hospital and it was, you know, it, it was his time maybe. But I just felt that way because. You know, there was a conflict situation, and in that moment, if he just would have listened to me, maybe we could have, you know, kept him uh, alive longer or got him to the right specialist that they could, they could, could solve this. And what um, what I did from that day forward is I, I just decided that I was going to make sure to, to change my appearance so these people trusted me. And so I already had the problem of being a 19 year old kid you're doing stuff like starting IVs. You know, somebody would be like, before I start the IV, I'm going to. Older, you know, I already had a problem. But this just really set it home for me. And so I have, when I uh, when I was 19, I uh, got a front page newspaper uh, article about me and how awesome it was that I was a 19 year old paramedic. But what I think is cool about this article is that, I don't know if you can see the fine print, even at this stage, when I was 19 years old, I was talking about the importance of the paramedic and how they presented themselves. And I told them, I don't wear earrings, even though I have my ear speakers. You know, I wear my uniform when tucked in all the time, even though my partner may not. You know, so these kinds of things, I realized that I had to come to the patient's level because they lived in a different time than, than me. And if, um, and if they saw me as anything other than the rescue were there to actually help them, maybe they see me as a hippie or maybe say, I don't know, but that's just not going to work. And so these are the kinds of things that, that influence me. So how is it that, that you connect with these people? It's important to make a good impression. I have, I have some examples of ways that we can make a good impression. You might say, hi, I'm Jason from the City Ambulance Service, and I'm here to help you. What's your name? That sounds pretty inviting, right? Did you remember what I was saying? That, that these experts that I used to have all this appreciation for, what was their what was their line? They wanted me to go in and start forcefully interrogating. This is this is uh, not going to help uh, build that uh, therapeutic relationship like we need, right? How about this? One? Good evening, Amy. My name's Becky. I'm a paramedic. I want to be here to make sure that you're okay. Will, will you let me help you? We're going to work together to get you back on the road to recovery. 
It's also important to uh, help the patient be part of their own recovery, like take part in that. So, hey, Ms. Matthews, my name's Chad. I'm going to get to you with eight years in the field, and I'm here to help you feel better. Will you let me you know, partner with you? This is all the kind of stuff that can really make a difference. And so we got a person that we have built a relationship with by building rapport, and now it's time for these hypnotic directives, so to speak. So it's time to, now that you have the person listening to it in the right way, um, you can deliver some really strategic messages that can help. And it's not, I had this patient one time who was uh, a really large man who was trapped. And he was trapped in a place where I could not get him out without removing a whole wall. So I was honestly in a spa where I was thinking that he was going to die before I could get the wall removed. So it was really intense. And the patient was very large. And so I had to talk him into um, self propelling himself to get up and move from the spot so that I could take care of him. So he's trapped in like this. So in a case like that, I can't just walk up to somebody and say, get up, move your ass. Right? I can't do that, right? I need him to know what I'm there for, why I'm doing it, and that that report has to be there. And he has to know that I'm there um, to deliver um, his care. And, and so that partnership, getting it together, is, is necessary. So how do we use words? Well, one of the things that we do commonly is we try to be as visually descriptive as we can. So if you can imagine that whatever words I use, I am just going to keep positive and I am going to keep really visual. So if you can imagine that someone is, is really cold, I might say something like, imagine that you're sitting next to the fire with me. Let's just close our eyes and just imagine the warmth because my jacket is, is a warm jacket, but now that I have my eyes closed, I don't know about you, but I feel the warmth coming out from, from, from my chest now. This warmth is in my armpits too. And it, it, it's really pushing away the, the snow feeling and all the cold air feeling. So these are the kinds of descriptive words that, that, um, that can be helpful. Another one that I have is about uh, chest pain. So er, you might tell a chest pain patient, everything is, is looking good. You know, we have all of these electrode stickers on your chest. And so because they're there, and because I want to help you feel better, let's just close our eyes together. And I want you to imagine all of these electrodes that are on your chest having a, having a string stuck to them. And we, these sticky electrodes that have a string have balloons on the end of them. Let's just imagine that, that you're holding balloons with your chest because, um, because we, we, want, we want to see what effect this can have. And what, what balloon colors do you see? I might ask them, they might see green and red. And then, and then we imagine those together. Now, let's just um, believe that these balloons can lift this pain from your chest. Let's imagine that, that the, the pressure is being moved in an opposite way and it's being released by these. So this is the kind of mental imagery that can really help somebody. And there's lots of positive phrasing stuff. So you might say, you're not dizzy anymore. Right? That's not the same message as you, you're feeling clear headed. See that, how that sounds different? You might say, in a few moments, you won't feel like crying. Well, that doesn't sound as good as in a few moments, you will feel more relieved. So you can see that some of these things have to do with practicing certain words and knowing that some words work better than others. In this case, go breathe so fast. That sounds kind of intimidating, right? As compared to breathe easy. You're not going to die. You're going to live. Sounds a lot better, right? <laughs> the other component to this that I think is really important is that we have to be honest with our patients. I had this patient one time who was trying to prevent her boyfriend from committing suicide. And her, her boyfriend or husband, I don't remember which, had a shotgun. And she was trying to talk him into stopping with the gun. And she did not you know, want him to kill himself. And she ended up with her hand on the end of the, the barrel of the gun, and it went off by mistake during the time where she was trying to talk him out of this, right? So what was left was that her hand blast was like, this much was removed from her hand. She could see it, and it's like flopping, you know? So 
I have to be honest with her. I can't say, you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be good. No, I have to say, we're taking you to the specialist that takes care of this very thing. And because we're taking you to them, you're going to be in a much better position because they handle things like this all the time. And technology is great. I'm sure that after some time when you work with them, that you'll be able to be in a better spot. You know, so it's it's not um, it's not time to be uh, doing and, and looking on that, right? So I I feel the same thing about enthusiasm. That we have to uh, put out the, the correct amount of enthusiasm, and enthusiasm can be fake if we don't do it right. So it's all part of like initially connecting with that person in the The other thing to mention is that. There are lots of times where myself as a paramedic, I can't give pain medicine, right? A lot of abdominal pain patients, we don't want to give pain medicine to because when they get to the emergency room, all of a sudden they're feeling fine. Well, the doctor can't even do a correct assessment. And patients that have uh, blood pressure that's too low can't give pain medicine. Patients that can't start an IV on, same thing. So this shotgun blast hand person was one of those people. I couldn't start an IV on her because she was, um, uh, she was too overweight for me to be able to get the IV. And so, all I have left are the reassuring words that I can that I have out there. And one of the number one things that has happened in hypnosis so far up to now is there's been a lot of research work done on pain, pain management, a lot of it's been and done in, in, uh, in burn centers. And so that's that's where it's at now. And I'm here to take this from, um, from theory in, into practice. I'm here to say that I have being able to see a remarkable difference in my patients, right? Like, can you imagine the person that's going through the worst pain they've ever experienced and you get a smile out of them? You know, these are just these are remarkable um, kinds of things. But I have felt that by using these techniques, we're able to reduce anxiety, we're able to reduce pain and legitimately help people. And then all along, we're on this path of treating people right Treating people like they're your family, treating people like they're human. And that's what I want to see. I want to see doctors that look at their patients in the eyes. And, and, and I want to see nurses that, that deliver caring, reassuring statements. I want to see paramedics that protect the patient from stupid things that bystanders might say that, that, that would hurt the situation. And, and I thank you for being a part of that because now that I've gotten to share the story with you, um, you're in it with me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. We can end here. So, unfortunately, we won't have time for questions, but I know you'll be around our two for different things. Um, and we have your contact information that we can share. I also want to thank all of you for being here today, especially, again, those of you who aren't from this area of campus and who've come to visit over here. I also need to say a special thank you to Xavier and Alicia who helped set up for today. We appreciate that. If you are an undergraduate student, especially in Com, please join us at 11.30 tomorrow in Com 2010 for lunch with Graham, where you can talk to him about, you know, being on the job search, putting your Com degree to work, et cetera. Um, if you are not from our program and uh, if you need something to show we don't have a paper program or anything like that but if you need something to show that you were here today please see me before you leave and i'll send you an email before the night is over um, so that you have that and i also want to invite you back this weekend to our theater um our uh, dr craig Beamrich philbrook is opening his show ways to say goodbye that runs thursday friday and saturday at 8 p.m here in the Kleino. so we hope to see you at that um, have a wonderful rest of your day, and thank you again for being here again. Thank you. One more thing. Um, if you want to talk to me, I'll stay here. So just hang out after you meet your talk. The other thing is that on your way out, I left my business cards right in front of the box office. So on one side of the card, it's like a QR code for my book, and the other side is a QR code for the podcast that I do. So there's flyers that are on that for you to check out or a card for you to pick up on the way out. Thank you. Chilly. Oh, hold on here. Negative hypnosis. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, okay, I need to tell myself I'm getting warmer. <laughs> There's that sound of the AC, and it's just like, oh, sure. okay. Do you please clearly print your name and your email address on here? And I'll
end of the day, it's like, okay, I am. Are you? Are you next to me too, Josh? You have to send there. Uh, oh, I didn't see you. So no, yeah. Yeah, he was, I was looking at it. But then I think for a we're all. Well, okay. Okay. If there are others who doesn't pass the word on to them, to um, once you get the email, actually you can just forward the email to them. So I won't have your names on it. It'll just be like a letter that's on your side. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, he was telling me that you might. Yeah, we need to forward you. Yeah. Like, oh, I think I think we started getting the information out. Yeah. He's yeah. so definitely. Oh, uh, uh, I'm sure to tell him that. He was I'll like, be happy to do it. Yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. Me and the Chad, we were So they love it. Oh, my gosh. He all has such a, you know, of course, he doesn't tell me things he can't tell me, but. Y'all in the PR. You know, I've seen that. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. I have such a different respect for all of you delivering medical assistance as well as like people now that I'm getting an indirect uh, glimpse into that life. No one better than Yeah. How much did he charge you to say that? Not a dime. Helping me out. <laughs> That's very sweet of you. Yeah. <laughs>